Welcome to the Adolescent Depression webinar provided through a collaboration between the Pennsylvania Medical Home Initiative, a program of the PA chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and funded by the Pennsylvania Department of Health, and the Children's Tips Program, a telephonic psychiatric consultation service at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and funded by the PA Department of Human Services. This webinar series aims to address important information about depression, helping identify adolescent depression with screening tools, assessment and evaluation, understanding the basics of assessing safety, and other issues presenting in primary care practice. I'm the pediatrician at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children, Renee Turchi, and I am also the medical director of the PA Medical Home Initiative. This webinar is being recorded. This recording is available on both the PA Medical Home Initiative and Children's Tips websites, and will be posted on the University of Pittsburgh Internet-Based Studies in Education and Research ISR, ISER website. For CME purposes, please be advised that both Dr. Schlesinger and myself have no disclosures. Please note that the information presented in this webinar is educational in nature and does not necessarily represent the views or policies of the PA chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics nor its funders. Now, please allow me to introduce Dr. Schlesinger. Dr. Abigail Schlesinger is a child and adolescent psychiatrist with an interest in increasing access to quality behavioral health and developmental services for children and families. She was instrumental in the development of Children's Community Pediatrics Behavioral Health, CCPBH, a service that embeds therapists and psychiatrists in pediatric primary care. CCPBHS has won local, state, and national awards for efficiently improving access to care. Dr. Schlesinger has been appointed Clinical Director, Community-Based Services, Behavioral Science Division, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and is leading the integration of developmental behavioral and community resources. She is the Medical Director of Ambulatory Integrated Behavioral Health for WIPIC and is the Medical Director of the Children's TIPS Telephonic Psychiatric Consultation Service Program at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh at UPMC. We are delighted and grateful to have Dr. Schlesinger present on this timely and important topic for primary care clinicians. Dr. Schlesinger, please begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Turchi, and I'd like to thank um, uh, AAP and the state for uh, allowing us to talk about this important topic, adolescent depression, with a specific emphasis on primary care. Um, my goals and objectives today are to help you be exposed to important information about depression that will help you guide your PAC practice, to be able to identify adolescent depression with both screening tools, assessment, and evaluation, to understand the basics of assessing safety, exposed to the components of an effective safety plan, and understand the role of pharmacologic, meaning medicine, and non-pharmacologic interventions for depression. This is actually part of a two-part series. I will also be um, doing a webinar on SSRIs, um, specifically digging more into what to do once someone decides to use an SSRI, although that is only one comp important component of treatment for adolescent depression. Um, I think there's been a lot of talk about adolescent depression in the last few years, um, and uh, I think this picture is, is only one representation of how adolescent depression can affect a girl, although it's important to realize that it can affects girls, boys, transgender youth, um, and families. And instead of background information, I purposely call this important information because I think that the, the background information is very vital in helping not only pediatricians and primary care physicians, but families and children and adolescents understand depression. So some of these, this data I won't read through every sentence. You can read it on your own. I think highlights how surprisingly prevalent uh, depression is in adolescents, and specifically how prevalent it is in children that come to primary care that is the bottom uh, percentage, 28% point prevalence for adolescents with depression being seen in primary care. It's important to note that prior to adolescence, both boys and girls get depression at the same rate, but that once uh, a certain stage of adolescence is reached, the rate of depression doubles for young girls. Um, and that 
at least 8% of teens are depressed at any one time. More recent data has suggested that the rate of depression has increased 37% uh, in the 10 years leading up to 2015, and that the rate of suicidality, actual completed suicides in the 10 to 14-year-old range was the largest increase in suicides um, across the age span. Although suicide is thankfully still a rare outcome of depression, it is uh, increasingly concerning that it's increasing in this population. It's very important to understand the risk factors of depression because there's reason to believe that if we capture depression early and treat it, we can uh, change the lifelong potential implications of depression. Certainly a family history of depression and mood, mood disorders is a risk uh, for the development of a depressive disorder. Uh, important to note that a personal history is also a, 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 history, uh, a risk factor. So if a young child or family says that they think a child has gone through a period where they felt low, uh, understanding that period better and realizing that's a risk factor for future depression is vital. Um, most kids with depression have had some other diagnosis prior to this. It may be anxiety, it may be ADHD. We don't often think of, uh, many people don't think of these things as risk factors, but they certainly are. Uh, as well as substance abuse is both a risk and known can be worse in youth that have uh, depression. Uh, and another highlighted factor there is trauma, um, as ACEs is something we often talk about, and that the more trauma a child has experienced, the more likely they are to have a depressive di disorder. Trauma can include psychosocial adverse adversity. Um, and remember, a child simply coming in saying they have an emotional problem it may sound basic, but means that it could be depression, and that medical and chronic il illness is also a risk. A typical depressive episode lasts about eight months, and probably many of you have heard that already. Uh, what else lasts about eight, eight months? A school year. Um, and as a severe depression can really alter the tra trajectory of a child's experience. Um, many children that have a depressive disorder will have a recurrence within one to two years, um, and, if, and that 70% will have a recurrence after five years. So it's important that once we, once we identify youth with depression or at risk, that we continue to follow up and we continue to be aggressive about helping them treat the risk factors that they can and uh, develop resilient, resiliency. There's also more comorbidity with depression that's important to remember specifically in adolescents. Um, there's a higher rate of risky sexual behavior, physical illness, and complaints, and that these teens also have lower satisfaction relationships and uh, attending higher education, truly showing that adolescent depression alters the trajectory of life for a child. Um, I often say that for kids with, uh, that for adolescents, one of their chief jobs is developing social relationships and how they interact with their peers, and depression directly interacts with that. Um, and up to 50% of youth with depression have two or more comorbid psychiatric diagnosis, anxiety, dysthymia, which is chronic depression substance use, ADHD, and disruptive behavior disorders. So, and certainly we can't talk about depression without talking about suicide, because untreated depression is the number one cause of suicide, and there's no question about that. Um, and that over 90% of children and teens who complete a suicide have a mental health diagnosis. Um, I think this CDC that's data that's next, I think, distresses a lot of people, um, but it's important to, to mention that in 2015, high school students, 18% of them reported seriously contemplating suicide, and 9% attempted at least once in the preceding 12 months. It's important to note that by asking about suicide, we are not going to make people think about or have suicidal ideation, but by asking about it, we can intervene. And suicide continues to be the number two cause of death in the U.S. in those 10 to 24 years old. So as physicians, I think this is one of our chief concerns is preventing mortality and morbidity. And by intervening with depression and asking about suicide, you can definitely impact the life outcome of children and youth. So in the DSM, there are many different diagnoses in the current DSM-5 uh, that, that are related to depression. And I don't expect a pediatrician to be able to specifically diagnose uh, the differences between these, although there are some general um, knowledge that can help you uh, be both a good consumer of uh, information once someone's seen a psychiatrist, but also do a better job of treating the youth that, that are in your settings. Um, so major depressive disorder is depression. We'll talk about the specific diagnosis. 
Persistent depressive disorder is the new word for dysthymia, uh, unfortunately named since the, uh, it is now the new PDD, for those of you who remember that autism spectrum disorder used to be called PDD. Um, other specified depressive disorder just means that a child has depression but hasn't fil fully fulfilled criteria. Um, there may be many kids that are very impaired by depression but don't have the specific number of criteria. So that gives the uh, providers an option to give someone a depression disorder without having the specific number of criteria checked off. I put adjustment disorder in there, although that's not supposed to be specifically used for depression, because many clinicians in the field may be worried about giving a depression disorder and may give adjustment disorder as a diagnosis. But if someone continues to have adjustment disorder for a long period of time, it is most likely that they have converted into another diagnosis. Major depressive disorder is one of many. I included disruptive mood dysregulation disorder and bipolar disorder in this list, not because I expect a primary care disorder, uh, physician, physician to be able to diagnose these, but it's important to know that they exist. So disruptive mood dysregula dysregulation disorder uh, is often called by people in the field, quote, tan temper tantrum disorder. Uh, we don't know a lot about this disorder. It was new in the DSM-5. Uh, it was, it's for young children uh, who are chronically irritable and, and frankly, tantrum more than would be expected for developmental uh, trajectory. This was actually created because there was a concern of too many children who were disruptive and irritable getting the diagnosis of bipolar disorder, when in fact they're more at risk for depression than bipolar disorder. So this category was created to help us better understand these young children with uh, irritability and, and frankly temper tantrums. Um, there is no evidence-based psychopharmacologic intervention for disruptive mood dysregulation disorder at this point. Um, and it's mostly meant for young children, but if you see it, uh, you can have an idea about what that is. And then bipolar disorder uh, consists of depressions and mania, so quite important to know that that exists, and we'll talk more about that later. So in order to diagnose depression, you must first recognize it, and uh, I think that there's quite a lot of support for the concept of screening these days. So, Behavioral scales or screening are not meant to be diagnostic, although there are some studies, especially in adults, using things like the PH29 for diagnosis. In pediatrics, they're typically not used like that, and it's important to get additional information. They also can be quite great to provide talking points to understand how the child is doing, and they can be used to follow a response to any intervention you may do, medicine or otherwise. The PHQ-9 or the PHQ-A um, has had widespread testing in primary care. It's self-report. Uh, it's exclusive for depression. It's fairly quick to complete. It's available free. It's truly ex accepted as the gold standard. And a significant store is 11 or greater, although 15 increases the specificity for um, depression. It's important to note that there is a suicidality question on this form. And there are many varieties of this form, actually, some of which delve deeper into the suicide but the specific PHQ-9 has a suicidality question on it. So this is one version of the PHQ. This is actually the adolescent version. So the, the history of the PHQ is that the 9 came first. Those are the first nine questions. And then the PHQ was adapted for adolescence. Um, what I see happening in the field is that many systems are going to simply using the PHQ-9 over the PHQ-A. So I wanted to talk slightly about the differences between the PHQ-9 and the PHQ-9A or PHQ-9A, the adolescent version. So first, the, the nine questions are essentially the same, um, except for an important piece, and I have that circled there, irritability. And we'll talk more about how irritability is actually a cardinal symptom for depression in adolescence, but not for adults. So they actually added the word irritability to number one in the adolescent version. So if you're in a system that's using the regular PHQ-9, that word irritability will not be there. Um, that does impact probably the sensitivity of the document. And if you are using the PHQ-9 and someone has irritability, uh, you might want to ask that specifically. Um, there are also some other slight differences, which I didn't circle here because I think they're less important. Um, but seven has a question about concentrating on watching TV, which may even already not be apropos as many kids aren't watching TV very much <laughs> anymore. Um, question nine is that lethality question. Uh, that is the same question the PHQ-9 and the PHQ-A. Um, and then those 
five questions on the bottom aren't on every single PHQ-9 and actually aren't involved in the psychometrics, but are additional questions that have been added to help uh, clinicians get additional information. And notice they also provide more information about suicide attempts and uh, past history of depression. Um, if you're choosing which forms to use and you don't feel comfortable asking these questions, this is a way to enter into this, the question area, um, but many systems simply use the one through nine, either the PHQ-9 or the PHQ-A. As we're asked to do more and more and more and more screening, the PHQ-2 was developed, um, which is essentially the first two questions, the PHQ-9. Um, and notice that's little interest or pleasure in doing things. Notice that the irritability is not there in question number two, which is feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. The PHQ-2 is screen is positive it's, if it's greater than or equal to three. And um, significant testing was done on the psychometrics, and it does have a, quite a good sensitivity and specificity for primary care populations and its sensitivity and specificity compared to the PHQ-9, not the PHQ-A, uh, is sufficient to say that it is an adequate replacement. Um, scoring positive on the PHQ-2 correlates with higher functional impairment and higher parent-reported internalizing problems. Internalizing problems essentially mean impairment related to depression. So the downside of the PH2 is that there's no question about suicidality on there. So um, you may miss children that have suicidality without depression. Um, it's also not useful for following response to treatment since there aren't enough questions to actually differentiate uh, mild changes or changes over time. One approach that's been used in several systems that seems to be effective is to, if, if you don't want to use the PHQ-9 or the PHQ-A, is to screen all adolescents with PHQ-2. And then for those who screen positive, open up into the PHQ-9 and then use that over time. So it's a stepped approach if you're not interested in using the larger PHQ-9 or PHQ-A. So once you've screened, um, it, you need to move into the assessment phase, just as in any other medical condition. So before we talk about the specific diagnostic criteria, there's some clinical pearls for assessment that I found useful. Um, one is to establish basic rules from the beginning, um, including confidentiality and when confidentiality must be broken. Um, it's important for adolescents to know that in terms of your patient-doctor uh, relationship, that you will keep the information they tell you confidential unless they say something that will put them acutely at risk or say that they've been harmed by someone else. Um, this is very important to establish before you get into the scenario that they've told you this information and then you need to backpedal. I've seen this happen with many trainees and it can be quite frustrating for both the provider and the family. Um, it also can be use, useful to interview with the parents together and with the adolescent alone. Adolescents can give you a lot of information and as you all know, uh, adolescents are more likely to be open and thorough without their parents present. Um, that being said, I think interviewing the parents and patient alone can also give you a lot of information about how the child and adolescent is presenting in front of their parents, so both can be quite useful. Um, it's important to emphasize with the patient, the adolescent, that there are no wrong answers. Um, you're asking them questions about how they feel, what their perception of life is, and that there is no wrong answer. Um, you want to understand how long they felt how they feel. Um, when do they remember being happy or being themselves? Uh, remember, people that are depressed sometimes have trouble remembering happy situations. So some people may say they never felt happy. Um, but some may be able to say, this has only been going on for a month or a year. Also, don't lead them to the answer you want to hear. I think the classic trap here is that you don't want to hear about suicidality. So you say, you haven't been thinking about killing yourself, have you? Or you haven't thought about hurting yourself, have you? Um, adolescents are very good at hearing what you want them to tell you. And if they hear that you're maybe nervous or don't want to hear about things, they just won't tell you. Also, um, another frequent trap is when we see children and adolescents that seem to be doing very well, that seem to have a lot of strengths, there's a desire to want to tell them what their strengths are, in an essence telling them that they have a reason to be happy or that they have a reason to want to live. Uh, 
there's a lot of data showing that it is not useful to tell someone why they should feel some way, some way or even to give them a pep talk. It's much more useful, especially during assessment, to get all of their information and to empathize with how they're feeling. So some specific developmental issues, and although we're focused on adolescents, I just wanted to pull out some information about how prepubertal children present, because um, a lot of times when I hear about a, a primary care doctors seeing adolescents, they can describe some of these prepubertal issues that they saw for years leading up to the full-blown depression. So uh, children with depression are likely to have increased somatic complaints. These are the bellyache kids, the headache kids. Um, they may truly have a migraine disorder, but have a lot of trouble managing it because of their uh, overwhelming uh, emotional needs. Young children may be more likely to be agitated. So we typically uh, picture depressive people as slow moving, sad, head down. Young children are more likely to be agitated and feel like they can't sit still. Uh, whereas Adolescents are more likely to be irritable than sad. Young children that are depressed are more likely to have mood congruent hallucinations, meaning seeing, seeing things, not because they're psychotic or schizophrenic, but seeing negative things as a presentation of their depression. They're more likely to refuse school, have phobias, separation anxiety, and increased worry. As I said, adolescents are more likely to present with irritability being their top complaint, or perhaps it's their parents' top complaint. Uh, they're more likely to be apathetic, say they don't care, uh, uh, say it to their parents. <laughs> um, they'll have low self-esteem, more likely to present with aggression and antisocial behavior, have substance abuse, but that they can give a reliable and detailed history, especially when their parent is not in the room. So a common uh, evaluation tool for depression is SIGI CAPS. Uh, many of you may have heard it in training. Um, and the SIG I have there is sleep, interest, guilt, E is energy deficit, C is concentration, A is appetite, P is psychomotor agitation or retardation, and S is suicidality. To have a full-blown diagnosis of depression, you need to have one cardinal symptom plus four of these additional symptoms from SIGI CAPS. For an adult, the cardinal symptom is either depressed mood or anhedonia, meaning not enjoying anything. Um, for children, they could have irritable, irritable mood in, in place of either, um, because, or, and adolescents, because they are more likely to present with irritability. So again, for a full-blown diagnosis of major depressive disorder, you need to have depressed and or irritable mood or anhedonia plus four of the additional symptoms. And there's irritable mood for children that doesn't count for, for adult depression. Again, I don't necessarily expect primary care doctors to be able to diagnose bipolar disorder, although I've had a number of doctors do a wonderful job of picking up on even hypomanic, which is uh, lower than mania symptoms. But many families will come in saying their kid is, has bipolar, uh, in quotes, because they have mood swings. The fact of the matter is mood swings or being happy to sad is a normal part of adolescence and childhood. Uh, children and adolescents are learning how to control their mood um, and may get easily irritated with people without having depression or bipolar disorder. But both depression and bipolar disorder should be a clear change in, base, in, in baseline. Um, and for bipolar disorder, really what's most sensitive is having a period of expansive mood or tantrums that could not be repl replicated in terms of energy and duration, um, and preferably not only in the home. Um, they may appear energetic and overly confident, feel special, be a risk taker when they aren't generally that way. Again, talk rapidly, loudly, and have racing thoughts when they're not generally that way. Uh, they may start new, many new activities when generally they haven't. Um, become sexually preoccupated or uninhibited, and have a decreased need for sleep. Um, I think that this often gets confusing for kids that have ADHD because they can have some of these things all the time. But again, this is where the change piece is really important. Most people with bipolar disorder present with depression, although not everyone, but most people present with depression first. 
So again, that makes the change as they switch to this expansive or very irritable mood that's different than baseline even more clear. So and here are the specific criteria for those that are interested. And I don't expect any primary care doctor to de necessarily be able to remember that hypomania is four days and mania is one week. <laughs> um, but there are specific criteria. Uh, the uh, mnemonic that's useful for bipolar disorder that I think is useful to memorize is dig fast, um, which is distract distractibility, irresponsible behaviors, grandiosity, flight of ideas, agitation, sleep, which is decreased, and uh, being talkative. Um, and there are specific criteria. You need more criteria to be fulfilled for if irritable mood is their cardinal symptom. Um, but if when you're seeing a child and you just understand the symptoms um, and that it's a change from baseline, um, a full-blown mania is hard to miss. I've had many doctors call and never had seen it before and say, I'm pretty sure this kid in front of me is manic. So the differential diagnosis is vital, just as in any other medical condition. Um, certainly bipolar disorder in a kid that presents with depression is something we need to consider. And asking, has there ever been a period of time that you haven't needed sleep and you felt on top of the world is one way to capture a history of that. Um, drug and alcohol abuse, we can't ever forget the high risk of uh, the combination of depression and drug and alcohol abuse. Um, remember, since ADHD is one of the more common conditions in childhood, uh, kids with ADHD do get depression. Um, they may really struggle as they pass through adolescence with the low self-esteem related to their concentration and A motivation. It sometimes can be hard to separate out the A motivation related to the ADHD and that related to the depression, but that's where understanding the other diagnostic criteria is very useful. Um, adjustment disorder is in the differential diagnosis, but again, if they meet the full criteria for depression, you should diagnose depression. Um, and again, there's that persistent depressive disorder, which is uh, the children that have been depressed for more than a year at a time. This, you can have both persistent depressive disorder with and without a full major depressive disorder. A child that's been depressed for more than a year um, definitely needs thought about getting intensive services so that they can get better. And here are some of the medical differential that needs to be considered. Uh, kids with depression can have thyroid conditions, anemia, a general workup can be useful. Never forget about obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and there are medicines that can cause depressed mood. Um, so getting, as always, a clear precipitating history is useful. So you can't talk about depression without talking about safety, um, as suicide is the worst outcome of depression and one that we want to avoid. Um, the way to avoid it is to ask about it and to help people plan. But that also means that you need to understand it and not be fearful about the questions related to thoughts and actions in suicide. And this is one way to ask about suicidal ideation and actions um, by understanding the severity of the thoughts and actions, the frequency, meaning how frequently are they having them, the intensity, meaning how hard are they to get rid of, the intent, um, the lethality, uh, meaning if they've had a specific thought about killing themselves, what was the likelihood that it would kill them, the motivation, and the precipitance. Um, these are only some things that you can evaluate about suicide, but I think they do have some similarities to any other medical condition that you might ask about. If you think about asthma, we want to understand the severity of the symptoms, how frequent they're short of breath, how much they bother them, <laughs> what does it take to change it. Um, in many ways, this is not different than identifying other conditions as long as you, you need to understand the precipitance of the behaviors. And there is a continuum of suicidality. Um, so all the way from morbid thoughts, which we may not think of suicidality, um, but can be a sign, especially in young and uh, adolescent children with depression, um, to passive death wish, which is this thought that they be happy if they didn't wake up in the morning, but not thoughts about actually harming themselves. There's suicidal ideation, meaning thinking about wanting to die, but not actually having a method or plan. There's suicide with a method, plan, and intent. Um, and those can be separated out as well. So there can be suicide with an idea, but, but 
never wanting to act on it. I would say not infrequently children will say, when you ask them about suicidality, if you don't ask enough questions, they'll say, well, I would never do it. Um, and as soon as I hear I would never do it, I delve in and ask, okay, I'm glad to hear you would never do it, um, but have you had a specific plan? And that's a very important question to ask. Children will answer, adolescents will answer that question if you ask it specifically. But as in all other things with adolescents, they will not answer if you don't ask them the question. They're going to, ask, they're going to answer exactly what you asked about. Um, an aborted interrupted attempt is important to, uh, to remember those exist too. There are many people that may get close and stop. Um, and a suicide attempt and completion are obviously the end of that continuum. Um, I think what you don't see on there, on this list, is uh, self-injurious behavior. Um, that is a risk for suicidality, um, but those are children that are hurting themselves, not with an intent to die or kill themselves, um, but because they like the feeling or it relieves their pain. Um, if you have thoughts of self-injury, you should evaluate them just like you would evaluate suicidality um, because they are at a higher risk of suicidal ideation, interrupted attempts, and suicide attempts. Um, but there is quite a difference between someone uh, doing something to end their pain and someone specifically trying to kill, kill themselves. Um, so I think I said this before, but I'm going to say it again. It's really important to ask directly. Um, and you also want to normalize depression. So you want to stigmatize the concept of killing yourself, but normalize the idea that you have depression and some people have thoughts. I often say to people, you know, thoughts don't kill people, people kill people. So we need to understand your thoughts and we need to treat your depression. This is one way to ask this question to normalize and ask directly. Say, to say many times children or adolescents who are feeling down or depressed describe having thoughts that they don't want to be alive. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever hurt yourself purposely? Notice how these questions are an entree into questions about suicidality. And don't try to differentiate out of the gate whether someone is having self-injury or suicidality, but they open up a wider array of behaviors so that you don't miss anything. And for many children, when you ask those questions on the last slide, you will get a negative. Because luckily, although suicidal thoughts and suicidal behavior does occur, it's still not common in children. But for some, you will get a positive response. And when you get a positive response, either now or in the past, you, you need to ask more questions to understand. Um, so these are some questions that you can ask that are direct and will get at the plethora of suicidal ideation people can have. So are you having thoughts that life isn't living? Are you having thoughts to do something to end your life? Do you have a specific plan in mind? Have you ever done something to try to hurt yourself? Has a child told the parent, a caregiver, or an adult, or peer about feeling depressed and suicidal? Since many adolescents will tell someone before they act. It's also important to ask about protective fact factors, um, because this is the beginning of getting better and staying better. Um, so what keeps them going? If they had thoughts, what stopped them from acting on these thoughts? Important to know, both because it's a protective factor, but also because if they lose that protective factor, they're at higher risk. Are they hopeful? Do they have supports? And then talk about who their supports are. Part of being depressed across the lifespan inadvertently makes people feel like they don't have supports. People that are depressed might also inadvertently alienate supports. Um, but by you highlighting who their supports are and helping them think about other supports, you can help to actually increase their protective factors, which is a uh, efficacious intervention. So many children will never get to the assessment of lethality. Um, but if you've asked those past questions um, and the child has indicated a strong current intent or a current plan, that should say plan rather than place, sorry, um, and a ch child admits to prior suicide attempts, it's important to understand what the current plan or attempts uh, are. So very specifically, what was the method they used? Was their intent to die? And what were the medical consequences? Um, 
I think people that don't ask about suicidality a lot are uncomfortable with these very specific questions. But youth that have struggled with suicidality will be thankful you asked these questions. And if they're not thankful and they're trying to hide, that increases my concern as a clinician, as a provider, that they need to be uh, in a higher level of care, perhaps even in the hospital. Um, so most youth that have had thoughts about suicide will walk you through, if you walk through with them, uh, the method, the intent, and any consequences. Um, my decision about how concerning someone is isn't just how medically complex or how medically lethal their attempt was, but how medically lethal they thought it was supposed to be, uh, especially with younger developmentally delayed children. If they did something and they thought it should have killed them or they researched it online and they thought it should have killed them, even if it couldn't have killed them, that is, that is very concerning and a child that I think needs to be, at the very least, watched um, and possibly even sent to the hospital. So once you've asked about suicidality um, and decide that, decided that a child is uh, safe, um, you should do a safety plan. You should do a safety plan for any child with any suicidality, um, any child with depression, because it's, we don't actually know which children with depression may need to use a safety plan. We know ones that have had past suicidal ideation are certainly at higher risk, um, but because stressors can come at any time, and for adolescents, stressors are some of the things that we, would, that we as adults might consider minor, uh, such as uh, being let down by a friend, having a breakup uh, that happen every day to children, uh, could move someone from depression to a suicidal. Um, to acting on suicidal ideation or having and acting on it. So every child with depression, regardless of whether or not you're using medicine, should have a safety plan. And uh, I, I encourage the pediatricians I work with to ask every kid they're seeing with depression uh, and anxiety, frankly, to ask what their safety plan is, um, even if it was originally uh, sort of proposed with a therapist they're seeing, because it's really important that you understand and make sure that they're clear on what their safety plan is. Um, I once had uh, someone who worked with me that said this is like riding a bike. They should be able to say their safety plan so that if they're feeling distressed, they can go straight into it without thinking very much about it. And frankly, so should the parents know what the safety plan is. So it's a structured plan that will be implemented to cope with suicidal thoughts and urges. And there are several components to a safety plan. Um, coping skills are tools for distraction. So essentially, what does a child do when they're feeling like they want to hurt themselves? Um, and safety plans can be used if you're having thoughts about self-harm or thoughts about suicide. Um, and then they should identify adults, not peers, but adults who are available and with whom the adolescent can contact. Um, it's really important that whoever that adult was that is identified knows that they're on the safety plan for the child. It doesn't necessarily have to be a parent, although I'm much more happy when it's a parent or caregiver. Um, you want to establish reasons to contact that, those adults. Um, you also want to make sure the child has emergency contact numbers. Um, you want to determine that the adults will use the emergency numbers. So the adults that are on the list need to know that they are on the list, and then they need to know the emergency contact numbers in case they hear from a child or adolescent and they're not sure what to do. Um, luckily, in Pennsylvania, every county has emergency numbers that you can utilize, and there are lots of options for these things. Um, it's also useful to establish a regular check-in time with the adults and the health professionals. That would be for the youth to check in with them, either with an appointment with the office or to check in with the parent to see how they're doing. Um, so remember, if there are safety concerns, that, they sh that the child and adolescent shares with you, especially lethality in that visit, that automatically breaks the limits of confidentiality. So other strategies that you can talk about. One is to avoid activities or situations that may trigger suicidal thoughts. A classic one is children that really like sad music. Um, maybe when you're feeling uh, depressed, uh, that is not the time to listen to the sad music that makes you feel worse. Um, the other is to identify internal processes to help you feel better, interpersonal pro processes, meaning friends to talk to, family to talk to, um, when and how to contact their therapist, and finally, 
when you have a safety plan, you should write it down and share it with everybody that's on the list. So, um, the next, once you've evalu screened, evaluated, and safety plan, then you need to have a treatment plan. Um, and the very basics of treatment planning from a psychiatric perspective and for uh, depression in adolescence is that mild depression, you should start with psychotherapy, moderate to severe depression, the evidence clues suggest that a combination of therapy and medicine is most effective. And this was sort of the cardinal study, it's the treatment for adolescents with depression study that showed that a combination of medicine and therapy was by far the most effective for the treatment of major depressive disorder. This was a 12-week randomized controlled trial of 12 to 17-year-olds with major depressive disorder. These, were, these kids were quite ill, actually. Uh, they, received, they were, received either placebo, CBT, Prozac, or Prozac and CBT. Um, and the highlights of this were that Prozac alone did outperform CBT, but that Prozac and CBT, CBT clearly outperformed Prozac alone or CBT alone. This has been shown in multiple um, studies, and the, com the, the clear benefit of a combination of evidence-based therapy and medicine has been shown um, in more than depression, actually, um, in, other, uh, in other conditions as well. So putting it all together, um, we're going to walk through a case now from the beginning, uh, meaning screening um, when a child presents to the office through um, uh, not quite the end, but through uh, improvement. So and in order to do that, we should first talk about the responsibilities of the primary care provider. So this actually comes from the GLAD-PC, which was endorsed by AAP. AAP and. Uh, put together by a pediatrician. And you'll notice that a lot of these things on this slide we've already talked about. Um, identifying and screening, evaluating, doing the basic differential, comorbid disorders, using sc behavioral screens, doing risk assessment, um, and then performing psychoeducation, supportive counseling, which we're going to talk about next, refer as needed, and then establishing responsibilities and roles to providers, and scheduling follow-up appointments and, and goals. I also think that many of these things uh, can have a huge impact um, on the outcome as long as you follow up consistently and do some basic psychoed and interventions in the room. So Olivia, this is a healthy 12-year-old who comes to you for a well child check. She's been generally healthy uh, with no behavioral health concerns, is cisgender, attracted to boys. She has, she has male and female friends who she hangs out with and texts. She's an athlete, an A student, and no dating or sexual history. Mom wonders whether she has, quote, hit puberty or there's something else going on because she comes in the house and doesn't talk to her. This is probably not an uncommon check. Um, and on first glance, Olivia looks like she's an easy well child check. And the question for mom, because she comes home in the house and doesn't talk to her, sounds like it could be developmentally appropriate. But she gets a PHQ-2 and endorses that she has little interest or pleasure in doing things nearly every day, which is positive. I think this really shows the clear potential benefit of screening, um, because it would be easy to write off mom's complaints as uh, developmentally appropriate. Certainly, she wouldn't be the first or the last mother I've seen with those concerns. But clearly, there's something going on from this screen uh, inside Olivia that needs further evaluation. So if you open up to the PHQ-9, her total is 13. Uh, remember, over 11 is, um, is significant for depression. So, and then you talk to Olivia. So she says she's been irritable most of the day for greater than a month. Because of her irritability, she's not enjoying her time with friends. She feels bad about being irritable and isolating. She's tired all the time and is have, having trouble concentrating at school despite sleeping 12 hours a night and napping. She denies feeling depressed. There's no changes in her appetite or energy level. She denies suicidality. And she has no trauma or substance use history. So there's a lot of information in there. Um, and it's important as you get that information to think through those symptoms of Gannett depression. Because just looking at the information without looking at the, the symptoms uh, can be confusing. 
uh, I've had doctors call me and say, well, she doesn't say she's depressed, but there are these things going on. Again, just like anything else we learn in medicine, go back to the diagnostic criteria. What does she have and what doesn't she have? So I've highlighted the symptoms here, and we're going to go through each one. So irritable most of the day for greater than one month. So there's a required symptom, irritability. Um, because of her irritability, she's not enjoying time with friends. Um, that's interest, sorry. And she's also sleeping more than normal. She also has guilt. So this is an important piece here that you may miss if you don't ask about it often. A lot of times kids that are depressed will feel bad about being depressed. Like they're guilty that they feel bad. <laughs> or they're guilty because they haven't talked to their mom more. Or they're guilty because they haven't followed through on things with friends. Um, that, that's a common symptom, um, but one you might miss in that description if you weren't specifically looking for it. She also said her energy is low despite all that sleep and that maybe her concentration is decreased in school. There's no change in her appetite, psychomotor, and no suicidality. And she says she's impaired. So mom's noticed something's changed. She's noticed something's changed. But I would call that mild. It doesn't say this in here, but in the case, I ask about how it's really impacting her life. Now, it is She's not enjoying time with friends, but if she's still going out with friends, that's a mild impairment. As you stop doing things, have decreased performance in school, at home, or with friends, that's as impairment goes up. So how should we help Olivia? I, her diagnosis is major depressive disorder, mild to moderate. It's often hard to tell. There aren't clear, although there are some ways to differentiate mild to moderate, uh, many times it's a, it's a judgment call. So. Um, I, I said mild on the last slide, um, but it's hard to tell whether it's really mild to moderate. So a lot of times I'll, I will hedge a little bit, um, and it's important to follow up to see how she responds over time. So if you say her diagnosis is mild to moderate, uh, interventions. First, you need to safety plan with her, which we talked about, uh, and then non-pharmacologic interventions. For mild intervent, uh, depression, clearly non-pharmacologic intervention is the first line. And even for moderate, it can be the first line. And you may refer her out to treatment at that point, or you may do some brief non-pharmacologic intervention in the office, uh, educate the parents, and then follow up in one month. You should follow up either way, A, because a lot of people don't end up in treatment, even if you refer them, and B, because you can have a huge impact in letting them know this is something they need to respond to. So non-pharmacologic interventions, psychoeducation, so this psychoeducation is really important. I think education is what pediatricians and primary care physicians do every day and they take for granted. But some basic education about depression can really help a family wrap themselves around a child, um, helping them know that um, it's a change in mood that contributes to negativity, impaired functioning, low self-esteem, motivation, et cetera. Frankly, just giving a name to what's going on. This is major depressive disorder. This is no one's fault, but there's things you can do to make it better. Um, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of information out about depression in the media that may not always be true. So you as an expert saying, this is major depressive disorder. This is what it looks like. It's not your fault. It's not your parents' fault, but there are things we can all do together to get it better can have a huge impact. You can always talk about relaxation skills. Many children with depression also have anxiety, uh, and there are some basic things that people can do to help themselves calm down, as well as exercise has a definite impact on mild to moderate depression that cannot be overlooked. Um, activation is simply getting up and doing something. And I shouldn't say simply because it has a huge impact, and I do this with every child I see with depression. Um, depression makes you want to not do anything. That's how it wins. Um, and by just getting up and getting off the couch and doing something, anything, it doesn't even have to be exercise, um, you can reverse uh, mild depression, even some components of moderate depression. The other thing is that it's useful to assist in problem solving. Sometimes children won't show up in um, your office until they're already at odds with their parents over something, they're not completing work. Part of being depressed is, makes it harder for you to 
problem solve. So if there's some specific thing that the family is struggling about, helping them to problem solve through those situations can have a huge impact. You also want to enhance support and recommend psychotherapy. So you did that. She comes back a month later, and she, her PHQ-9 is 21. Luckily, she's not suicidal, um, but those first seven questions suggest to me that she is not better, and in fact, maybe even calling out for your help. So when she comes back, I guess this is actually eight weeks, which is not uncommon, right? You tell someone to come back in four weeks, and they show up in eight. Uh, she has been in therapy. Her symptoms are getting worse. She's trying to work on skills, but she can't actually utilize them because she's feeling uh, amotivated. And she's getting to the point that she doesn't want to do any of her previous activities. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that her impairment is up. So to remind you of the study, um, she's had CBT alone, but by adding medicine to the CBT, you can significantly increase her, the response rate. Many families will come in and say, I've done therapy either weekly or every other week for eight weeks. Um, that failed. It's time to move on to medicine. And I hearken back to this study. No, in fact, it is time to add medicine to cognitive behavioral therapy or to an evidence-based intervention. It may be even time to increase your therapy frequency because we know evidence-based interventions are, are closer to weekly than sometimes families will inadvertently be seeing therapists only monthly because it doesn't fit with their schedule. So when someone comes in and says they've, quote, failed therapy and they're ready for medicine, I'm very clear to say, I'm glad you started therapy. We know the combination of therapy and medicine will help you get better and even, I say, stay better. So at this point, if you're comfortable in a, with an SSRI, you need to do what I call the SSRI workup. This is going to be a brief overview for anyone who's interested in more information. I'll be doing another presentation just on SSRIs. You want to review the personal and family history of mania. You want to confirm that there's no new trauma, suicidality, or substances. So for Olivia, there's no family history of bipolar disorder. There is a history of generalized anxiety disorder and postpartum depression, but no mania. Um, so um, postpartum depression uh, can be associated with mania. So if you hear postpartum depression, you do want to ask about whether they've ever, ever had manic episodes, but she clearly hasn't. There's also no history in her of periods of time of not needing sleep, being, quote, unlike herself, happy, impulsive, etc. So no evidence of mania. And there's no new trauma, suicidality, or substances since the last visit. So when to start medicine? You know, um, you obviously do it when these symptoms are significantly impairing functioning. The other time, as in with Livia, can be when kids are unable to make progress in therapy due to severity of symptoms or minimal improvement with therapy or worsening despite therapy. Also, the degree of distress or severity of symptoms may move you towards medicine. So some clinical pearls about choosing a medicine. Prozac and Zoloft have the most, the most studied in this adolescent population with depression. Um, Prozac has the approval. Zoloft does not. Lexapro is also approved for depression. You may want to ask what family members' response to SSRIs have been for two reasons. One, there are, is a genetic component that we don't entirely understand yet. But also, if someone's had a bad response to an SSRI uh, parent, they are much less likely to want to give that to your, their child. So a quick understanding of what SSRIs family members may have had in their response can go a long way. Another pearl is that Prozac has a very long half-life. That can be both a strength and a weakness. The strength is a lot of adolescents may miss days of medicine, and so it doesn't drop quickly out of your system. Uh, the weakness is if there's any risk of mania, it'll take a long time to go away, like up to five weeks. Um, Prozac is less likely to cause sedation compared to Zoloft, Selexa, and Lexapro, and um, there's more side effects with Luvox, which I really consider a second-line medicine. So when doing an SSRI consent, you should uh, discuss with the parent uh, the medicine. You should discuss it with the child. The child can't actually consent, but they can give you assent, meaning they agreed. Um, you don't, I don't necessarily believe people need to have a signed consent for medicine any than, other than any other medicine in, um, in our armamentarium as physicians. Uh, there may be people that disagree with me. Um, and I specifically 
describe when I do consent, I tell them that I'm discussing side effects that are rare and concerning or common because they may happen. And then you should discuss what to expect from medicine. So these are some more common side effects. Uh, because there's more serotonin in your gut than in your brain, uh, you may notice some changes in your GI system that will go away. Uh, although diarrhea is rare, I actually warn people because if they get it, they get really confused and stop the medicine. Uh, headaches, which also go away um, most often. Some, there can be easier bruising, sweating, lightheadedness, nervousness, sleep difficulties, sexual dysfunction, irritability, or activation. And then the rare and concerning side effects are mania. Obviously, you should stop medicine if you're concerned mania is occurring. Suicidality does not mean stop medicine. It means increase treatment and support because the medicine will help the depression if you keep it going, and serotonin syndrome. And I warn people about serotonin syndrome because of the, the, there are many people that also have headaches and are on Imitrex and other things that have serotonin with them, so they need to know uh, that, this is, that these two medicines together, other medicines that are serotonergic in nature, may increase their risk. Um, here's one example of a titration schedule, just so you understand uh, how fluoxetine, sertraline, citalopram, and escitalopram are related to each other, uh, what their therapeutic ranges are, and how they're typically titrated. Um, I titrate, I often start with fluoxetine unless I'm concerned about mania, and then I start with either sertraline, citalopram, or escitalopram. And I often titrate weekly. So duration of treatment. You need to titrate medicines as needed until efficacy or you've maximized the dose. Um, and then there's a maintenance period. And I talk to people about the titration and the maintenance every time I start a medicine. So I let people know we're going to continue to increase the medicine until you have full remission of your symptoms which just doesn't mean that they look a little better or they feel a little better. It really means that they're in complete remission which they may not even understand what that looks like when you first start, but I, I get them, I say that to help them start thinking about, you know, what do they think full remission would look like. And then once they're in full remission, they should stay on the dose that worked for nine, for nine to 12 months of stability. Um, in that period, it's best if they continue some level of therapy and work on mastering their skills. You know, I think many people are leery about medicine and it's not infrequently that if you don't have this conversation, someone will get better, stop medicine, and not return. Um, that's a risk for recurrence. So I warn people out of the gate that we're going to titrate the medicine until it's effective, and that being on higher doses it does not necessarily mean you have a worse depression, but if we don't treat you to full remission, you're at risk for recurrence. Um, and then I tell people that once they've been better 9 to 12 months, that we'll taper in a relatively stressful free time slowly. Um, I often talk about that as being a period that you're in cruise control and life is going well and not necessarily in the winter. So Olivia's treatment course. Her initial visit, if you don't remember, was a PHQ-9 of unchanged to 13. Um, her depression, she had depression with limited impairment and we did non-pharmacologic intervention. Eight weeks later, despite the intervention and therapy, she had um, increasing impairment and a PHQ-9 of 21. So at that point, we initiated Prozac. On her fourth visit, which was four weeks later, her PHQ-9 was relatively unchanged. So 25 is not that much different than 21. So this is not uncommon because it can take four weeks or more for medicine to work, and I warn people about that. And if she came in at three weeks, and it really wasn't a full four weeks, then that's even more of a chance that it doesn't work. Mom states that she's starting to look better and is getting out more, but she doesn't feel better. This is also very common. So this is a sign she's improving, but oftentimes parents notice it before kids. So at that point, even though there are slight change, signs of improvement, I would increase Prozac to 30 and, and it should say and instead of or, follow up in two to four weeks. I guess you could or as well, actually, if you weren't sure whether to increase because there, was, um, there are some signs of improvement, you could just follow up as well. Um, but probably the best thing to do for her would be to increase and follow up. Eight weeks later, um, her PHQ-9 is down to nine, which is a significant improvement. Olivia agrees she's feeling better. 
and the next few steps in treatment are to follow up in 48 weeks, reinforce the importance of non-pharmacologic intervention. So her treatment course has gone um, over several months, um, and she's starting to get better. So uh, to remind you again of the responsibilities of a primary care physician, um, many of these we've covered in this, these, this presentation, but we also added some additional things about how to intervene with medicine if you are interested. Here are some additional resources uh, from the Suicide Prevention Action Network, NAMI, and the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists. And I'd like to thank all the clinicians and staff who work to improve the lives of the youth and families struggling with mental health concerns. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk about adolescent depression. I'm now going to turn it back to uh, Dr. Turchi. This concludes our webinar, and I want to thank you, Dr. Schlesinger, for your excellent presentation. Please look for our other webinars in this series that are focused on depression, anxiety, confidentiality, and consent, and other timely topics. Many thanks again to the Pennsylvania Department of Health for the funding that made this behavioral health webinar series possible. Thank you. <laughs>